Ecology is the study of the biotic, the living, and the abiotic, the non-living factors that make up the living world and the interactions that we have between them. When we talk about ecosystem ecology, uh, we have to define the ecosystem first, and an ecosystem can be defined at uh, many different scales. It could be a fish tank, it could be a grain of sand, it could be an entire continent, <clears throat> it could be the entire globe. So ecosystems have uh, different scales that we can look at. And the laws of uh, thermodynamics and the laws of matter that pertain to the rest of the physical world are the same laws that uh, e um, living organisms uh, obey, and the same laws that we see in ecosystems. And <clears throat> one of these is the laws of energy. And in this uh, diagram here, I've got energy uh, going <clears throat> from the sun, and then the red lines are indicating uh, energy flow through different parts of an ecosystem. And so there are some uh, words here like primary producers, and these would be the <clears throat> organisms in the ecosystem that would capture that uh, energy from the sun and uh, turn it into uh, organic molecules. In other words, these are the photosynthetic uh, pigments that uh, allow this to happen. And then the primary consumers are feeding off of these primary producers. And then we have secondary consumers that are feeding off of those, and tertiary consumers, and we could have quaternary consumers. In every place that there's a, a red zigzag line leading any of these, what that indicates is that we've got a uh, energy that is leaving the system, it's flowing through the system and leaving as heat. In other words, it's not a very usable form of energy. So if there's some losses due to heat, although you know energy is not lost, it's just not a very usable form. And so everywhere along the way you can see that happening. Uh, the blue represents here the different chemicals and nutrients that you would find in a system. And the blue actually cycles through an ecosystem. Uh, it, it can be exported out of an ecosystem. We could talk about examples where you know, bananas are grown in tropical soil when they come to North America and the nutrients that are in the banana peel now you know, are no longer in Costa Rica or Ecuador. But in general, we can say nutrients and chemicals cycle through systems and energy actually uh, flows through systems. In other words, energy does not cycle through systems, it flows through systems. Now, when we talk about energy flowing through systems, we can look at a couple other uh, ways to define this. And one is net primary productivity. And this is the total amount of energy that's fixed uh, uh, per unit of time minus the energy expended in uh, metabolic activity. And one way to think about this in you know, strictly human terms is paychecks that you might get where your net uh, pay is usually the, the amount that's much less than uh, your gross pay. In, in other words, the taxes are out of it, uh, whatever insurance, all those deductions come out of it, so your net pay is always a smaller amount. So the net primary productivity is usually a much um, smaller amount. The gross primary productivity is total amount of energy converted to organic compounds per unit area of time. <clears throat> so in other words, this is the, the total amount of energy that um, is actually going into those organisms over a, a period of time. Um, biomass is all the, the mass of the living organisms in a, a particular area, and usually this is obtained by drying down uh, a section of the salt marsh, or whatever system you're looking at, and actually weighing the carbon that's left, and that gives you a mass, a biomass. And when we talk about trophic structure, trophic structure are the different levels or feeding relationships that we find within ecosystems. And these are commonly called food chains, and food chain is like a simple linear structure, so you grass, zebra, lion. Uh, but more realistic examples of trophic structures are represented with food webs, and food webs have uh, multiple relationships at uh, each trophic level in between trophic levels. So if we look at a simple food web, 
um, there's a number of uh, different components to that we can think about. So the dotted line here represents the break between the different trophic levels. So down here we would have the primary uh, producers, in other words, the photosynthetic organisms, so the aquatic plants, um, the algae, things like that. <clears throat> but also down here, and this is actually uh, a little deceptive, is the decomposers. And the decomposers, things like fungi and bacteria, are really, um, you know, could be scattered in different places here, but they're so pervasive and they're so important um, that they need to be included in food webs. Often they're not. Often you don't see them there. Uh, detritivores are things that feed on detritus, which is the decaying, broken down parts of uh, organisms. <clears throat> Decomposers are breaking the detritus down, breaking down the bodies, uh, recycling the nutrients, because the nutrients and the chemicals will cycle. The primary consumers are things like herbivores that are grazing on the primary producers. So these would be uh, uh, different types of mussels that are filtering the water and filtering out the algae, for example. Uh, the zooplankton, which are feeding on the phytoplankton, uh, invertebrates, sandhoppers, or insects, uh, grasshopper would be an example. And then we have omnivores, things like mice that would be feeding on these uh, primary consumers, so we would call these secondary consumers. And they could also be primary consumers. They could be feeding directly on the aquatic plants. And so sometimes these trophic relationships, uh, they could, and a mouse could be at different levels within the, the, uh, the, tr the different uh, trophic levels here. So they could be either primary consumer or maybe they could be secondary consumer, depending on where they're feeding. And then um, the carnivores that are feeding off of the primary consumer, so these would be the uh, zooplankton eating fish, the ones that are eating those. Um, these would be the carnivorous fish that are eating those, the uh, birds, the clapper rails that are eating the, the fish, and um, the shrews, mice, things like that. Heron would be feeding off of these. And then finally we have the tertiary consumers, which are the, uh, the very top, uh, and these would be things like owls and hawks. Um, <clears throat> there could be other creatures maybe, but you don't find much more than um, four levels, maybe five levels in any uh, particular food web, and there's a reason for that. And then finally there are vultures, um, or scavengers, um, and scavengers are important as uh, the decomposers and the uh, detritivores are in that they break down the <clears throat> organisms within the system. And so they're not necessarily tertiary consumers because they could be feeding at any level here, but we could put them at the tertiary consumer level. So this is a, a fairly simplified food web. Another important thing about food webs to make sure <coughs> you understand is that the head of the arrow is always going in the direction that the energy is flowing. So every arrowhead here is showing the direction that the energy is flowing. And remember, the energy will flow through this system, but the nutrients will cycle. And the nutrients cycle because of the scavengers, the decomposers, the detritivores that are breaking things down. Um, detritivores like crabs and worms that are breaking down the bodies, decomposers breaking down the molecules, um, and scavengers breaking down the larger bodies. So we can simplify that food web tremendously by putting uh, together something like an energy pyramid. And an energy pyramid shows the energy that's available at each of the different trophic levels. And so at the very uh, bottom here, we have uh, sunlight with tremendous amount of energy. And this sunlight, uh, of course, is the energy that the primary producers are using, the organisms that are using photosynthesis. And so if we, we look at some numbers here, we have 10,000 joules of energy that's being captured by the plants. Um, but when we go to the primary consumers, we see that there's only 1,000 joules actually still retained in these primary consumers, the insects will say. And then here our secondary consumers are getting maybe 100 joules, and we would say maybe mice are eating the insects. And then finally our tertiary consumers, our snake or our hawk, which are eating the mice, there's only 10 joules of energy. And so we have this uh, exponential decrease in the amount of energy uh, as we move up here in the tertiary, or in the uh, trophic levels. <clears throat>
And what this reflects is that uh, the energy is, there's not as much energy available. And if there's not as much energy available, you have fewer and fewer uh, organisms in the, in the particular food web. Um, when you represent it here as a uh, energy pyramid. And this is called the energetic hypothesis. And what it says is that you, the food webs or food chains are limited to four or five levels. In aquatic systems, you might see you know, seven levels. And the reason they're limited is because the energy that's needed for the organisms at the top finally is not available anymore. It's all been lost as heat energy um, as it moves up and up each trophic level. Now another way to look at um, these food webs is to look at biomass pyramids. And biomass again is obtained by um, taking a section of the, the trophic level and it's usually baked down and then the carbon from that level is massed and then you can come up with a idea of how much biomass is at each trophic level. And so again, if we took the plants, we would have more biomass in plants than we would in the insects, the next trophic level, then the mice, and then the snakes. Um, there would be fewer snakes than there are mice. And this is um, normally what you see is you see a pyramid, but they can be inverted. And we see these in aquatic systems where there's a high turnover rate. In other words, the phytoplankton multiply very, very rapidly. Uh, the zooplankton don't die quite so rapidly. And so you end up with um, more secondary or primary consumers than primary producers. And so in other words, the, the pyramid is inverted. Now there's a, another idea about why food webs and food chains are limited to four or five levels. And it has to do with stability within these. And that is that as environmental disturbances cause um, food shortages for the top, the, the snakes, the hawks, the things at the top, then their populations would collapse. And so you don't end up with food chains or food webs very long. Now, the bulk of the evidence from research suggests the energetic hypothesis but uh, the dynamic stability hypothesis is also um, out there to be tested. Another way to look at this <clears throat> is to look at uh, pyramids of individual numbers. In other words, we could look at the savanna and we could see that there are um, tens of millions of uh, grasses out there and plants, um, but there's only a thousand zebra and there's only a dozen lions. And so we have uh, huge differences in the numbers as we look at these different levels. And so our primary producers, our plants, we're gonna have the most of those. And then we're gonna have the primary consumers, we're gonna have next, they're gonna be the largest level. And then our secondary consumers is gonna be the next level. And then finally, at the very top, we're gonna have very, very few individuals. So there would be very few owls um, in a forest, uh, there would be more mice, um, there would be more insects, and there would be more plants. And so if we looked at the actual numbers, we can construct a, a pyramid of numbers of individual organisms. Now, there's another way to, to kind of look at uh, these different pyramids, and one thing you, you notice right away is that there's always a, a large standing crop of primary producers, and if there's a large standing crop of primary producers, that must mean that there's a lot of energy available. So why aren't there more organisms at these higher trophic levels? If the energy is there, um, we should have more of them. Well, the green world hypothesis tries to explain this, and what it states is that plants have defenses that keep these insects from eating them, or the mice from eating them. In other words, they have secondary compounds that make them unpalatable. Um, also, nutrients are limiting. So, in other words, the plants don't have enough nutrients to support the herbivore populations. Or abiotic factors limit the herbivores. In other words, uh, it's too cold, uh, day lengths are too short, whatever uh, the abiotic factor might be, it's too dry, uh, that limits the herbivore populations. Um, herbivores compete with each other, and if they compete with each other, then they're expending energy that's not being used to 
graze um, the plants. Um, so that's one idea. And then sometimes the community dynamics, the interactions between the different creatures is actually going to cause um, the herbivore populations to not be as great as they could because they partition the resources. And so that allows for a large standing crop of plants in the environment. So we have some competing hypotheses for why we see food webs being uh, constructed the way they are, but the majority of evidence points toward the energetic hypothesis.